Uh, so thank you for inviting me to, to talk to you today. Um, as John mentioned, I'm a part of the commercial real estate credit team within RBS, and I think it just might be helpful if I explain sort of what that is. Um, so essentially, there's sort of two lines of defense within the bank. We have the front line, which is really our customer-facing colleagues, our relationship managers, who, who deal directly sort of with, with the customer. And then I sit on the commercial uh, real estate credit team, which is essentially the second line of defense, and um, very much sort of a risk management approach where sort of challenging what the front line are doing to make sure that we sort of don't end up in a situation that we were a few, few years ago. So this morning, there we go. I'm, I'm going to give you a brief introduction um, into RBS just to give you a sort of perspective about what I'm going to speak about today and then really address what I'm here to talk about, which is what is sort of a lender's influence in sort of creating a more sustainable real estate sector. We'll look at what the primary concerns are for the bank and what they're doing to try and mitigate these risks. And then beyond pure risk management, identify some of the opportunities for lenders. And lastly, look at what's sort of happening in the industry and how we're collaborating to sort of build the profile for sustainability within commercial real estate lending. So looking at uh, RBS real estate finance, uh, you might be aware that RBS simplified their sort of divisions um, sort of more recently, and we've gone down from sort of seven divisions to three. So we've got personal and business banking, uh, corporate and institutional banking, or CIB, and commercial and private banking. And our real estate finance team really sits within commercial and private banking and is made up of over 500 specialists uh, dedicated to meeting the needs of our very diverse customer base, which in 2014 equated to about 12,000 customers from SMEs to large corporates. Though the majority of these customers will really be sort of small property owners who might not necessarily be aware of sustainability and the risks and the benefits um, um, as, as some of the larger sort of institutional investors like land securities, which we heard from Neil, would be aware of. So it's very much for us, uh, we see this as, as quite a, a key education and awareness engagement topic with a lot of our smaller customers. In terms of the size of the portfolio, in 2014 we lent just over £5 billion to our customers and by halfway through this year we had already lent uh, just over £4 billion. Uh, pounds. Did, did I say dollars earlier? No, I did say pounds. Suddenly I'm thinking, did I say dollars? So just over £4 billion, pounds, which uh, means, so we're actually expecting quite a strong finish to 2015, which is, which is good. When reflecting about what to talk about today and discussing it in length with my colleague James, I realised that as an industry we have a tendency to talk a lot about what others should be doing to embed sustainability within their roles, whether it's a valuer, a property manager, a landlord, an occupier. Um, and, and while I believe there is a lot more that we can all do to uh, create a, a better profile for sustainability and really implement uh, these issues within our roles more, I do think it's a lot easier to, to, tell, people, to tell people what they should be doing when, when you aren't the one doing it. And this has very much been my experience within RBS. Um, I know I am guilty of, before joining uh, RBS, of sort of talking about what lenders should be doing to incorporate sustainability and, uh, you know, the influence that they could have um, and, you know, the significant opportunity there was for lenders. And while I believe that is the case and while it's a very exciting time and I'm, I'm really encouraged by what's happening in the lending sector, um, it's not always as straightforward and as simple as we think it is. And this sort of led me to believe that we all have an influence in driving sustainability forward within, our, within the market and within our own individual roles. But as experts in our own individual areas, it's our job to identify what level of influence we have and where sustainability can be realistically and meaningfully embedded into business as usual within our own organizations. And I think that's really the journey that I'm on uh, at RBS at the moment, is really identifying what uh, the lender's influence is and what, you know, what it is that we can meaningfully do to, to address sustainability. So when looking at sort of the, the asset, the building, you know, an occupier really has quite a direct influence on, on the property. They're the ones using the property. They, they're the ones who determine how, how much... Uh, energy and water they're using and how efficiently uh, they're using resources really. Uh, they're responsible quite often for the fit out and how sustainable that is um, and they can do great projects to engage with, uh, with local communities and, and generally have access to quite a lot of sustainability data as a result of using the property. 
The owner also has, has quite a, a direct relationship and influence over the property, and we heard from Neil that the wonderful things that Land Securities is doing uh, to improve the sustainability of their portfolio. You know, they, they have uh, great engagement with occupiers and, and, you know, landlords can can sort of influence the way a building is used by sort of green clauses through sustainable fit out guides. Again, getting involved with, with uh, local communities and also have have quite uh, sort of easier access to this data. But when it comes to a lender, we have literally no influence over how a building is managed, or very little influence over how a, a building is managed, how it's used, how it's designed. So, so really, our level, at, at a build, um, our level of influence at the building level is very limited. So, you know, what is our influence and where can we uh, sort of most meaningfully um, address sustainability with our customers? Many of you might not be familiar with this term, uh, but it is a critical part of uh, the due diligence processes within the bank at RBS, and that is to know your customer. Now, knowing your customer is really about sort of understanding, you know, what is their approach to sustainability? Are they aware of sustainability risks? How do they intend to comply with minimum energy efficiency standards? Something I'm sure we'll talk a lot, a lot about today. You know. Do they have responsible property investment uh, policies for the, for the properties that they're managing? So it's really about engaging with our customer at this point. And it's at this point that we believe we can really share our knowledge in the area of sustainability and encourage our customers to think about these issues. I also believe that uh, it's critical that we identify the most meaningful engagement topics with customers. You know. For example, if, if I were to ask a relationship manager to start asking their customer um, you know, about their, their waste recycling, and, the cust and, and our relationship manager has a number of things to consider, of which money laundering is quite a big issue, they're probably not going to be too happy with me if I start asking them to, to gather waste recycling and, and water usage details. So for us, at, within the bank, it's very important about identifying what, those, what are those meaningful engagement points that we can have with our customer, and what is meaningful for the relationship manager without sort of burdening with you know, the, all these things that they need to consider on top of their day-to-day -day jobs. So, you know, what are the bank's primary concerns? Um, interestingly, a few weeks ago, was, I think it was about two weeks ago, uh, RBS uh, hosted the launch of the GRESP debt survey results um, in collaboration with the Better Buildings Partnership. And we found the, the results really gave an indication that a lot of lenders are already considering sustainability criteria without even realizing it. Because what's happening is that they're collecting these issues, but they're not necessarily defining them under the umbrella of sustainability. So, for example, we, we always look at where a property is located. Is it close to you know, public transport? We look at whether a building is capable of converting from one use type to another. So, you know, flexibility is, is already incorporated into our decisions. But it's just not that we're sort of pinpointing these, these things that we're looking at or defining them as sustainability. However, there are there are a few things that we look at at the moment, which uh, which <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, could definitely be sort of defined as sustainability or environmental issues. Um, the existing risks which we look at very much include those environmental concerns like flood risk, contamination, asbestos, invasive species, etc. And of course, then there's the emerging risks, which is the introduction of uh, the minimum energy efficiency standards from the 1st of April 2018, which for the bank, it's, it's, it's very much a primary concern and of great importance that we can understand you know, the impact these regulations will have for both our customer and to the bank. So what, what, are, you know, what do these concerns lead to? What are, what are the ultimate risks for the bank? Firstly, it's cash flow risk, and this has really got to do with the ability of the lender to pay back, uh, sorry, for the ability of the borrower to pay back uh, their loan to the bank. Um, a number of things could, could influence this, this cash flow risk. The first is any penalties and fines for non-compliance with uh, environmental or sustainability regulation. So we'll, we'll hopefully all know that with minimum energy efficiency standards, the, the fine is up to 150,000 pounds, and that can be on a cumulative basis. And again, for environmental legislation, there's a lot of penalties uh, for, for not being compliant uh, with that legislation. 
The second is any additional capital or operational expenditure that's required to either improve the property's EPC rating or alternatively to sort of remediate the site uh, from contamination or potentially a flood risk. And the last, and, and certainly not least, is the loss of rental income for our customers. So given the minimum energy efficiency standards, you know, if our, if our customers aren't able to generate rental income from the 1st of April 2018 or 1st of April 2023, that's a huge issue for us. Um, not necessarily just MEES, but also you know, with business continuity, if, if there's a flood risk and that property you know, cannot, cannot keep going, you know, does that mean that their tenant can't pay them, etc.? So there's huge things for us to consider and uh, in terms of cash flow. The second is, is reductions in value, and, and Neil touched on the sort of brown discount versus green premium issue. And for us, it's, it's really about sort of understanding what these issues can do to the value of the property, because at the end of the day, we're taking security on these assets. And for us, we need to, to understand how that, you know, these risks are likely to impact the future value of these properties uh, or substandard properties um, at the time when a sort of at the market related uh, value. So if a willing buyer and willing seller. So we need to, to always keep that in mind uh, when we're looking at, at transactions. And then the third one, um, which was quite difficult to define, but really failure to meet core values. And I think this is really li linked to just sort of making sure that, you know, the bank is, is acting responsibly and doing the right thing. And, and that means, you know, really embedding sustainability within, within our lending transaction decision processes. Because if we're not doing that, we're really going against our core values. Um, in addition, it's, it's really about making sure that our loan book is future-proofed um, to ensure that we are uh, protected against the risk of any potential future obsolescence. And lastly, I don't think anyone really wants to be left behind. So really, it's about sort of aligning ourselves with both the market and our customers especially, as well as with our peers. So what can the bank do to mitigate risks? Firstly, risk management processes and policies. And this is a, a sort of big part of my role at the moment. And that is really to sort of formalize and embed sustainability considerations within our len lending decision processes and are specifically our, our risk management processes. So we're undergoing a huge uh, sort of undertaking at the moment to do that internally. Define and monitor risk appetite. And this, I think, is also very much linked to sort of data collection. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the types of data points that we're collecting might be very different to that of a, a property owner or an occupier, but for us, it's about identifying what are those meaningful points that we can that we can collect, and then starting to almost report on them. You know, um, at the moment, regulators aren't requiring us to have this information, but as minimum energy efficiency standards are sort of becoming increasingly important, regul regulators might catch wind of that and sort of ask us to start reporting on how we are um, looking at that risk within our portfolios. The third is amendments to legal documentation. So really um, creating transparency between the lender and the borrower about uh, you know, changes that we're going to make and making sure that they disclose their EPC rating, potentially being able to demonstrate what their business plan is or how they intend to comply with uh, minimum energy efficiency standards. So that's quite a sort of not straightforward internally, but an easy way to, to sort of make some of these changes. The fourth one I've touched on already, which is just due diligence and customer, en customer engagement. Um, and it's sort of linked to the last one of education and awareness, which is both internally and externally. Uh, one of the biggest areas um, that I've been working on within RBS is, is education and sharing knowledge with the relationship managers and with people within the bank about these risks and really equipping them to be able to have these discussions or meaningful conversations with their customers about these risks and the potential impact for them on their, their properties and, and their portfolios. So I think that's, that's a very key, key issue. Um, earlier, I sort of pointed out, you know, what are, what are these, the bank's primary con concerns? And very much the word currently there is quite important because um, it's about educating everyone about, you know, what's currently a risk. But as our awareness increases and as our definition of sustainability broadens, it's likely that this list might expand. And, and, I, and I expect that to happen sort of in due course. 
And then beyond just pure risk management, uh, what are the opportunities for lenders? As I mentioned, um, you know, we're always looking for additional engagement topics with our customers, ways or, or reasons to sort of get in touch with customers, share information. And I think this represents, and it's been said within the bank, that this is a, this is a really interesting um, engagement topic um, for us to have with our customers. Um, there's been a lot of research done um, in the US um, very recently, I think it was launched earlier this year, that stated that energy star rated properties had a 20% lower likelihood of default, that lead properties had a 30% uh, lower likelihood of default, and lead is obviously sort of the American equivalent of BRAM. And that uh, buildings located close to a sort of or within a walkable distance of a, of a transport node had a 30% uh, lower likelihood of default compared to sort of other locations, which is really, really interesting um, information. Of course, we don't have the same in the UK yet, but I think that, that research sort of indicates that potentially going forward, there's the opportunity for banks to develop green loans or potentially green lending products. Again, in the US, and you might all be aware already, uh, Fannie Mae recently announced that sort of multifamily uh, residential buildings would receive a 10% uh, basis point reduction in their interest rate uh, if that, that property had a, a green certificate. So, so that's an exciting sort of um, just transformation about what's happening in, in the lending world. And ultimately, I think, you know, lenders do play a significant or have a significant role to play in creating a more sustainable uh, real estate sector. And, and it's about identifying where our influence is most meaningful. And at the end of the day, it's, it's about future-proofing um, our, you know, our property portfolio and making sure that uh, we are protected against any future obsolescence. So what's happening in the industry? You might all be aware um, that the Better Buildings Partnership has a commercial real estate uh, lending group, um, uh, which has been sort of going around for, for about two, three years now. No, more, longer, shorter, less. OK, but it's happening, and it's very exciting. Um, and recently, uh, they launched, it was about two weeks ago, we launched, uh, they launched their insight paper, which really looks um, or gives their thoughts as to sort of how, how lenders should be considering minimum energy efficiency standards, what they can do to mitigate these risks, and sort of looking beyond just minimum energy efficiency standards, because we like to just think that that's the only thing about sustainability. It also addresses a number of other issues that um, lenders could, could take into account. And I do recommend recommend that you read that paper because it is it is really interesting and quite meaningfully captures what lenders are doing at the moment to address sustainability. And then secondly, um, you might all be aware, you, you should all know about GRESP, I'm sure, um, but GRESP um, just this year launched uh, their first real estate debt survey and had uh, 10 funds subscribed to that this year, which equated to just over $5 billion uh, in aggregate net asset value. Um, and representing 127 assets or loans. So I think this is really encouraging just um, you know, to see what's being happening to build the profile for sustainability within real estate lending. And, and I'm keen to sort of keep working with these organizations to, to share our knowledge and to understand where our influence can be most meaningful. And then I have to just put this in here, it's very important, and more important information, and that's all from me. Thank you very much.